it is such a pleasure to work alongside of Fusion Academy and Karina and together offer these type of educational uh, workshops. Uh, uh, Embark offers many different programming, including intensive outpatient and short-term residential. Um, and we are typically close to Fusion Academy, so we've been partnering really nicely together. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Charnel Miles. Uh, Dr. Miles is a licensed psychologist and certified clinical trauma professional who specializes in the treatment of complex trauma. Her dedication to serving children, youth, and adults has spanned over 23 years with a focus on utilizing trauma-informed services to treat sexual abuse, physical abuse, domestic minor sex trafficking, and community-based trauma. Dr. Miles is the Vice President of Embark Behavioral Health, and we're certainly so happy to have her, where she is successfully oversees operations open to the, um, to the Georgia region. Currently, Dr. Miles manages Georgia, Maryland, and the DC region, and I myself as based out of the Philadelphia area. So thank you so much, Dr. Miles, for taking the time to provide us this awesome information, and I will hand it over to you. Just one other thing, if anyone does have questions, please put those questions in the Q&A section, and I'll be happy to uh, interrupt Dr. Miles, and you can answer questions throughout the presentation so it can be a little bit more interactive. Many of you asked if you're on the screen, you cannot be seen on the screen, just the presenter. So. Um, uh, just utilize that Q&A box when you want to answer any questions. Okay. Thanks so much. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Miles. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. And thank you, Karina, for having me. Um, it is always a pleasure for Embark to partner with Fusion Academy. Um, so I certainly appreciate the invitation to be able to um, speak about collective trauma this evening. Um, something that I don't think any of us are strangers to, uh, given the past 18 months that we've had. Um, and so tonight I'm gonna be intentional just about talking about how do we um, support our teachers, how do we support students, whether they are in private school, public schools, um, and um, really just talking about how do we get through these next several months um, in school while we are still um, just in the throes of the pandemic. And so again, we're going to be talking about collective trauma, supporting teachers and students returning to the classroom amid COVID-19. And before we jump into this conversation, it is always important whether you're doing a webinar, um, a live presentation in the classroom, outside of the classroom, to just be intentional about creating a safe space. Um, again, for many of us, we may have experienced single trauma, a complex trauma, collective trauma. And so we want to first and foremost, be careful and be intentional about entering safe spaces where we can not only hear the information that's gonna be shared, but also ask questions, learn from the information, while at the same time, taking care of our own self-care. And so we're going to create this space of safety. We want to maximize opportunities for choice and control. And so what that means is you are making a choice to attend this webinar this evening. You also have the choice at any time to press mute, to ask a question, to step away from your computer if you need to. You have the choice to be in control of how you interact with me this evening how you interact with other guests, and if you just need to log off because you're becoming um, maybe a little overwhelmed or triggered by something. And so I want you to maximize um, your right for choice and control. The other piece of this is really to foster connections. And so, you know, the past year and a half, um, I've been doing a number of webinars or Zoom meetings, and I always get the question, how do we foster, you know, connections 
through a webinar? Well, it's possible. So again, you have the choice to send me a message. You have the choice to follow up with me. Um, so that again, we are connecting, you are receiving support. If you need resources, I'm gonna share some resources at the end of this webinar. And if you don't see a resource that you may have been looking for, just shoot me an email. Uh, my contact information will be shared um, and I'll be able to share that resource with you. As well as if you need to connect with Fusion, someone at Embark, um, we are definitely going to make ourselves available uh, to you as well. And then the last thing in terms of creating safety is to manage emotions and promoting self-reflection. Again, you've made a choice to be here. And so this is your time. This is your time to learn from the information that I'm gonna be sharing. Um, based on that information, you may experience a, a range of emotions. Um, you may uh, have an opportunity to just sit and reflect on maybe what your life was like um, as a parent, as a teacher, as a clinician, whatever your profession is, but just as an individual, you'll have the time to reflect on maybe how you've been impacted by COVID-19, whether it was you directly or a loved one or someone around you, but you do have the right, you have the support, to manage your emotions the way you need to. Um, there's no right or wrong way to do that. It is all based on uh, what you feel comfortable in doing. And so at any time, if you don't feel safe, if you're getting triggered by some information, um, again, if you need, just need to check in as a follow-up, please do. The opportunity um, is, is here. So please take the opportunity to follow up um, as needed. There are a few objectives to tonight's webinar. We're gonna describe how the current pandemic has precipitated a new paradigm of what is considered normal uh, for many individuals, particularly students. We're also going to describe the effects of trauma and its collective impact on education personnel and students. Schools have opened, some schools are getting ready to open. And so there is a lot of anxiety about what's gonna happen in the next week, what's gonna happen in the next two weeks. How are um, not only students, but teachers going to manage um, uh, their, their, uh, their trauma or symptoms related to the trauma that they have experienced. We're also gonna develop a trauma-informed self-care plan to increase access in several areas. And so I'm gonna share with you um, a self-care will. Uh, one is completed, one is blank, but hopefully you'll walk away with um, this diagram and work on this for yourself. It is a living, breathing document. And so um, you can work on this, this self-care plan for months, for years, um, just based on what you need in the moment and what goals you have for yourself. So I wanna, I'm excited about being able to share that tool with you. And then last but certainly not least, I'm gonna provide you some um, resources. Everyone needs resources. So I'm going to provide those for you at the end. Um, again, it's not a exhaustive list. Um, and so if there's something else that you're looking for in terms of a resource, feel free to reach out to me um, after this webinar and I will do my best to uh, find that resource for you. So let's jump into this. What is trauma? What is trauma? And it, again, if you want to um, connect with me, just go ahead and you can answer some of these questions that um, I'm gonna ask during the webinar. And so when you think about trauma, what does that mean? Um, there are different types of trauma that individuals have uh, experienced, one being a single trauma. And so that can be one single event that may be harmful or life-threatening. It can have lasting adverse effects on you. Um, and also, 
um, you're functioning, whether it's mental, physical, social, emotional, or even spiritual um, functioning. And alongside a single trauma, some individuals also experience complex trauma. And now this is a term that we've been hearing more of uh, during the last, you know, several years. Um, complex trauma, typically multiple traumatic events, often an invasive or interpersonal uh, nature. And typically with complex trauma, what we are seeing most often, especially in children as well as teenagers and some adults, is that they may experience one trauma that goes unresolved, experience another trauma that's unresolved, another trauma that's unresolved and so on and so forth. And so oftentimes when you have multiple traumas like that, um, it, which are invasive um, and have lasting effects, sometimes it may lead to a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. We look at that as being complex trauma. And so within the past, what, 18 months, um, our worlds were just about turned upside down. And so for a moment, I want you to think about our children. I want you to think about our teenagers. I want you to even think about adults because when the pandemic hit, no one knew what it was. We didn't understand where it was coming from. We did not understand the lasting effects, how, you know, if it was like the flu, if it was going to be something that um, just came and, and would go. And so January 21, uh, 2020, that was the first day that the U.S. actually confirmed um, an individual who was in the United States with COVID. And so... Again, we had no clue whatsoever. Oftentimes I hear a lot of stories that, you know, individuals experience COVID-like symptoms even before January 20, 2020 and really thought about, you know, did I have COVID at the time? And so there were many anxieties, confusion, just a number of uh, responses to COVID when it first sur surfaced. Um, but there were a lack of resources and understanding to really support individuals, especially our children. Also during that time, or over the past 18 um, months, there's been a number of issues that we have had to deal with. And so again, I want you to think about complex trauma, how I just described complex trauma, in a series of events that begin happening here in the US. So there were murders that occurred in multiple states. There was um, an increase in children, teenagers, families experiencing hunger. There were, oh gosh, tons of school closing, not only here in the US, but around the world. Also community-based violence. That was something that many of our children, many of our families were already dealing with prior to COVID. And now there was a spike in community-based violence due to everything else that was going on. And for many individuals, they had no clue of how to effectively deal with uh, what was going on right in their own backyards. And not only that, the number of deaths that were occurring due to COVID was just unimaginable. Um, you know, when we talk about death for some individuals, especially children and teens, that's a hard topic to deal with. But as it relates to COVID, so many people were not only becoming ill, but began losing their lives at a rapid, a rapid rate. And as our children were being exposed to that, again, they were thrown into this web of trauma. Some that had been resolved in the past, but a whole new set of traumas, um, which really began leading to some collective trauma. 
The other thing that we were really dealing with was um, political uprising. So again, just a number of issues, it really complicated individuals' ability to um, cope and actually push them past their normal ability to cope. And so this is what happened for many people. There were some individuals who may have just, you know, experienced one single trauma and um, coping became a little difficult for them, but they were still able to stand. They were still able to get up in the morning, um, take care of some of their daily functioning, maybe go to work, even though they were working from home, um, be available uh, physically as well as emotionally for their families. But there were some individuals who were already dealing with issues of trauma way before COVID happened. And when COVID hit, it just sent them to a place where it was almost unbearable to cope. And so again, we're looking at the difference between a single trauma and complex trauma. But next we also have collective trauma. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what collective trauma means and how that really began to um, impact us. So with collective trauma, um, this was something that Erickson looked at years ago. What is that, about 44, almost 45 years ago? And so when Erickson looked at it, it, it was like he hit the head right on the nail. Collective trauma refers to the impact of a traumatic experience that affects and involves entire groups of people, communities, and societies. Collective trauma is extraordinary and that not only can it bring distress and negative consequences to individuals, but in that it can also change the entire fabric of a community. And so when we look at um, a more recent definition, very similar, Collective trauma can also impact relationships, alter policies and governmental processes, alter the way the society functions and even change its social norms. I think that we've seen um, this play out definitely within the past 18 months. Not only did the impact of COVID have, or not only did COVID have a direct impact on our communities, it actually had a universal impact. There was not many places that anyone can go where COVID was not present. So whether you were in the US, outside of the US, COVID was present. And for many people, they didn't know really what a pandemic was. You know, they did not know how to survive a pandemic, let alone maybe, you know, a, a local trauma or a single trauma that they may have experienced. And so I want you to think about two questions. I want you to think about the last time you experienced collective trauma prior to COVID-19. I want you to think about that for a moment. And if you want to share, just, you know, in general, um, feel free to put it in the chat box. But I want you to think about the last time that you really experienced a collective trauma to the point of it impacting a society, a community, an entire group of people, changing the fabric of what you knew as, as normal or the fabric of um, um, societies universally. So think about that. Can you see some of the comments in the chat? Um, let me see. You want to read a few? Uh, many are saying 9-11. 9-11, absolutely. Any other comments? And so um, I can agree. The 2008 financial and housing crisis. Mm -hmm. And then Sandy Hook. Yep. School shootings. Thank you. 
Absolutely. And now I want you to think about prior to COVID-19, and some of you have already answered this question, what events which resulted in collective trauma impacted your children or students? Definitely the school shootings have impacted our students. Um, 9-11 has definitely impacted um, a whole generation. And so when we look at COVID-19, which was a global phenomenon, right? A little different than some of the other collective or some of the other traumatic events that occurred. Um, it really made it difficult to really understand what was this thing that was happening and how would it impact us? Even you know today, we really don't understand every single thing about COVID. We don't understand it fully for adults and we don't fully understand it for children. And so even with COVID, a lot of people felt like there was no way to escape. Um, one of the responses to that was that we were to some degree forced to isolate. We were forced to um, wear masks, you know, not touch anyone's hand. Um, we were forced to talk or have these difficult conversations, not only with other adults, but our children and just hoped that they understood what was going on or the concern, the danger around COVID. And so for a lot of people, what was once known as their safe spaces were no longer safe. For an example, school. Many um, children sought school as a safe space. Um, however, you know, at the blink of an eye, we were told school is canceled, kids had to stay home. And I, I can remember the day that our schools were, um, our schools uh, went into sort of lockdown here. Um, and I say lockdown because there was one teacher who became sick and the officials closed the doors. No one was allowed in and no one was allowed out because they feared that whatever that teacher was dealing with was COVID related. And so I can only imagine the fear that many of the students in that particular school experienced, the fear that the adults experienced, the fear that parents experienced while they were waiting outside of that school and were not allowed to um, uh, pick up their children. And so school was not seen as a safe space at that time. And even now, again, there's still a lot of anxiety around entering the school uh, school building. Most academic institutions did not have uh, contingency plans. And so for a number of students, uh, they look forward to going to school for a hot meal. Once those students were forced to uh, remain at home, schools were scrambling. They didn't know how to get meals to students. They did not know how to get educational material to students. They were scrambling to get laptops and other supplies to families because a lot of them did not have contingency plans as it related to responding to a pandemic. And again, we just did not understand the magnitude of COVID. And so this definitely pushed millions of people past their normal ability to cope. Um, and it resulted in isolation, confusion, uh, decreased access to many resources that people and you know, families depended on every single day. Uh, people were are becoming ill and then ultimately death. And so, you know, I think I'm, I'm quite sure in saying um, the trauma of COVID was collective, but the burden of it was unequal because it impacted people differently based on um, race, class, uh, where you live, what school you, you attended, just so many uh, factors. 
And so what I want to do now is I want to um, share with you a brief video that allows us to see life with COVID-19 through the eyes of children. E quindi noi invece di abbatterci lo contrattacchiamo e lo rinchiudiamo e fuori quindi sarà un mondo molto più bello. The Prime Minister says the provinces and territories have agreed essential workers making minimum wage can expect a pay raise. Justin Trudeau said the province. And I want to underscore that this has been a truly collaborative effort. Right there is the playground that people are usually going to instead of the school playground. It's closed too. The swing set broke. And it's not supposed to be played with right now. Dinom shobo minanti nom shobo I feel bad because I don't know my family is it is catch at catch up with this coronavirus <clears throat> so i i don't like it this corona це ще одне один митник просто це скажемо що медведь оцей чоловічок дає медичну справку що на кораблі усі здорові крім однієї людини яка от тут загратиме в ізоляції The roots here at the bottom is all the new like possibilities we like can do or have taken. And the leaves that are falling, um, they are like the lives we have lost. That symbolizes the lives after this all happened. end. Um, I think it'll be much more full of life. I think people won't, won't take things for granted anymore. <laughs> Listen, my friends, yeah, thanks to the virus. It's a real crisis, yeah, it's coronavirus, man. Hey, hey, ah, uh, hey, ah, uh, hey. Don't be afraid to weep. If you dig deep, you will see. You will be living in a world where everyone cries. So from that video, um, we clearly, again, understand that uh, COVID impacted um, the world in so many ways. And our children here in the US, in many ways was no different or impacted uh, no different than many other children throughout the world. Uh, there was fear there was death, um, there was um, an interruption in, in schooling and their social emotional learning. And so we had to, or it's important for us to really look at the impact of COVID and not only the impact that it had about 18 months ago, but the impact that it will continue to have in the future um, and consider some social determinants of, of mental health, really. And so things like, you know, child development, um, income and social status, social support from other networks, uh, education. And one way to really do, um, to consider that is to um, talk about ACEs. And so the goal is really to try and decrease ACEs um, before a pandemic even happens, because we know that when a pandemic happens or when there is a traumatic event, the ACEs will increase. Um, and so 
you know, ACEs, trauma, traumatic stress are all important to understand as potential driving factors behind our children's or our teens' behavior. And we know that um, with different uh, early childhood experiences, they don't necessarily um, predict the outcome of what will happen to a particular child who experiences um, a adverse uh, childhood experience, but it does tell us about the risk. And so COVID definitely fits in here. Uh, it's something that we will, I believe, continue to consider, examine and research for the next several years because it is definitely going to have um, a lasting impact on society. And so a few things to remember about ACEs. Um, anytime a child experiences four or more ACEs, um, that child is going to need increased support. And just a few statistics um, for children who have experienced just one ACE. Um, and looking at the, um, um, the racial composition here, and so 61% of Black children have experienced at least one ACE. 51% of Hispanic children and 40% of white children. This is really, really important when we think about the effects of the pandemic, because again, we know that its impact was not equal across races or across communities. And particularly for um, uh, uh, communities um, um, that are majority black um, or BIPOC, they were already um, dealing with decreased access to medical care, decreased access to healthy foods. And so when uh, COVID hit, it just widened that gap for many of these communities. There was also a significant impact on learning, um, unfinished learning. And so what unfinished learning means is that for many of the children, because schools closed, they did not have the opportunity to learn what they could have learned or the amount of um, learning, well, the, the amount of information that they could learn, um, they were unable to because of the, the pandemic. And so for students K through 12, they were on average about five months behind in math. Um, and four months behind in reading. Again, this is significant because we already understand um, the longstanding gaps uh, within certain communities as a result of decreased schooling, um, uh, um, decreased reading abilities, as well as math abilities. And so, uh, the pandemic widening that pre-existing uh, opportunity as well as achievement gaps for many of these communities, um, his, especially disadvantaged communities. There was research that also looked at um, learning opportunities and unfinished learning for elementary age students, middle school students, as well as high school students. And it really did appear that uh, high school students uh, were hardest hit. And so for many high schoolers, they drop out of school, um, particularly those high schoolers that are or live in underrepresented or are a part of underrepresented communities. And there were many more who did not go on to attend post-secondary education. Um, so when we look at this, we need to think about what is the transition going to be um, in the next couple of weeks where kids are now having to go back into the classroom. How are we going to continue to um, decrease that gap? How are we going to um, make up for time where students were uh, pulled out of school while also considering their ACEs? We also want to consider autism. Again, prior to the pandemic, uh, there was a national uh, issue 
as it relates to absenteeism. Um, this chart here that you're looking at was um, absenteeism rates among students in the eighth grade through 12th grade, which increased significantly during the pandemic. And I'm sure there are many reasons uh, for that, you know, whether it was um, a family who did not have access to internet, a family who may not had access to a laptop or a computer, um, a kid who was forced to work instead of going to school because their parents were unable to work or maybe a, a parent was sick or maybe a parent um, uh, died as a result to COVID. And so there's many reasons why students um, or absenteeism rates um, uh, increase during the pandemic. So this is what we are faced with now. Schools are opening. Uh, many schools are not giving families the option to do remote learning. They're saying, no, students have to come back in the school. There are federal dollars being threatened. Um, if, if schools enforce mass mandates, so just so many things going on um that still bring about feelings of confusion not only to parents but also teachers as well as students and even though as the largest society is really focusing on getting students back in the schools which which is important for many reasons our students are still faced with anxieties around catching covid as well as death and so that is something that we must continue, continue to um, consider as we are supporting students returning to the classroom. So let's look at pandemic harm beyond academics. Um, yes, the pandemic impacted academics, but it also impacted our behavioral health. And so uh, we saw an increase in fear, isolation, depression, um, anxiety, definitely suicides amongst our teens, grief, addictive behaviors, uh, even exploitation of children, um, substance use, difficulty sleeping. So we have to continue to pay attention to our teens or our children's mental health, and we have to make this a priority right along with their educational needs, because really these two things go hand in hand. So it was one survey that was done and it was 16,000 uh, families or parents across every state in the US. And 35% of those pa uh, parents reported that they were very or extremely concerned about their child's mental health and social and emotional well-being. And approximately 80% of those parents has some level of concern about their child's mental health, social and emotional health and development since the pandemic began. Now that was just at the start of the, pan the pandemic. I want you to think about how many of um, our children were dealing with some of these same issues that were unresolved prior to the pandemic. This is why it has been very important for um, mental health programs to work collaboratively with schools, even as they were, um, even as they were offering virtual services to our students. But we had to ensure that addressing the mental health of our students was front and center. And this is something that we're gonna have to continue doing even inside of the classroom. So here's another quick video because I wanted you to hear what some students um, had to say about COVID. Quarantine in this pandemic, it's a lot. <laughs> When I heard we weren't coming back to school, it didn't really seem real. It was like a very unbelievable type of thing. You're like, you're on a break, but at the same time, you're like trapped. It's like this pit in my stomach. And it's just, I know it's just about the uncertainty about how things are gonna play out. Um, I'm worried about 
just really everything. I feel kind of distant from my teachers. I mean, I know social distancing and stuff, but I just, I don't feel as connected to them as I do in the classroom. I feel myself being kind of unfocused. At first, the work that they gave us, it wasn't real work. It was kind of like just busy work just to do. And I wasn't engaged or interested in it. Our work is very important to us. So I feel like the teacher should just take an extra thought or an extra second to just ask and see what their students need. Phone calls, text, emails, like anything where I can feel like I can hear your voice. If you want your students to succeed in their schooling during this pandemic, I think you should really communicate with them one-on-one -on -one so you can really understand what they're going through. Around the third week, they started giving us options. So we ended up doing these projects and it was like really cool and I think it just brought the interest back in our schoolwork. Having to create physical objects or create physical products. Giving your students the chance to have extra time even when you're on a tight schedule. We know that we're going to have to be more reliant on technology in the future, so why not start and teach it now? It's really surprising how many people like complain about school day after day after day. And then as soon as this happens, everyone's like, oh my gosh, I need to go back to school. We have suffered through a lot yeah but we just need to keep on to our hope i'm still getting my diploma regardless if we're walking the stage or not i still need a diploma to go through with my career mm, graduation this is the day that i've been working towards forever so take a minute and i want you to share what are the down stories have you heard from maybe it was your child or your children, or if you are a teacher from your students about how they are really feeling about the pandemic and returning to school. And if you like, take a minute and put it in the chat. And I'll read them. Uh, Tracy says, worrying about getting sick or bringing the virus home to family members. Mm -hmm. And that's a real fear. That's a real fear um, of many parents, many students. Many of my kids I work with have started and they're super excited to get back to school. Mm -hmm. Students are nervous for family members. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, um, one point of feedback that I've been hearing uh, more lately is from children or teens who are asking the question about, you know, why are teens being more impacted now than adults? And so because I've heard that question over and over, I think that there is um, definitely, you know, a heightened uh, fear because more teens are now seeing some of their friends having to go to the hospital um, or being diagnosed with COVID. And they also see, you know, these pictures and videos of hallways of schools where kids are sort of just packed in. Some kids have a mask, some kids do not have on mask. And it's causing um, real concern not only for the teens, but also for parents now who don't have the option of virtual learning. I see the chat number going up. Are there more questions? There's just some comments. Uh, Courtney was saying that kids I work with are nervous about making friends after not connecting so long. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Laura says, it seems like kids with anxiety increased and have poor coping skills. Uh, let's see. Sorry, the, it moves up and I have to switch back to it. <laughs> And so the, the comment about uh, social skills and, and poor coping, we're definitely going to talk more about that as we look at how we can support children who are returning um, to the classroom. And I'm going to talk more about trauma-informed social emotional learning. Um, there was one more that I think is important. Um, one 
person type, some students got comfortable with school at home and have routines and now feel anxious to return back to the building. Yeah. I think that's it. Parents balancing mental health and social skills. Right. And so what I want you all to begin thinking about, we're going to watch an, another video, but these are all good comments, great questions. I want you all to start thinking about for those children, for those teens who um, have shared their experiences with you, their fears with you, I want you to begin thinking about how, have, how do you support them return into the class? Is there something creative that you've done? Have you um, had to reach out to get support from uh, your community, a mental health provider, a school counselor? So I want you to, and you can go ahead and, and put it in the chat, um, but how have you um, responded to many of the fears that some of your students or children have begun um, experiencing? And I also want you to hear from our teachers because we cannot forget our teachers. For most of our teachers, the line um, or the boundary between being a parent and being a teacher, it disappeared for many teachers because again, they had to make a choice of do I stay home with my child? Do I teach my child? Do I protect my family? or do I return to the classroom? There are some schools now that are requiring teachers to get COVID vaccinations. Um, some who are not, there are some schools that are requiring teachers uh, to wear masks and some who are not. And so teachers were put in, um, in, in a, a, a really tight situation in terms of some of the decisions that they had to make. But at the end of the day, teachers were just like you and I. We were all faced with um, the, the reality that we could potentially contract COVID. We have a family at home, but yet we also had our career. Um, so let's hear a little bit about what teachers are saying. Honestly, the first thing I want to do is just burst into tears. My tank is empty and I need to binge all the Girl Scout cookies and only wear sweatpants for at least three months straight. I've been a teacher for 27 years and this is the first time I have just hated what I do. It has nothing to do with the kids. We were heroes one minute and then vilified. People wanted to blame us for having schools closed. I wanted to stand outside the school with a megaphone and just shout, I am just a lady. I have no idea what is going on, but I am here. I'm really trying my best. Uh, there are things that I think we'll be able to take away from this, but <laughs> for the most part, it's like, uh I have taught hybrid, then remote, then back to in-person, then we got quarantined, and then I have to do state testing. Somebody somewhere is not listening to educators. So I had my kids in the classroom, not really socially distanced. Then I had my kids on Zoom. Then I had kids I never was able to find. They were just missing. Like, take attendance, like, I just gave up. I care about my kids, I love them. But I feel like I'm choosing between my sanity and everything admin required of me. I think one of the hardest things, it's making the middle schoolers wear their masks so we can stay at school. It's like, would you just put the damn mask on and leave it on your face, please? It's been a, a struggle, but I also have really valued this year as a time to question a lot of the things that we believe about public education. This is our chance to really shake up education, to look at what really matters, to look at how do we spend our 53 minutes in class each day. I teach high school ELL students to see them struggling at first, but overcoming all their challenges in a virtual environment. 
I'm so grateful that I looked outside as a way to safely bring my students back to school. Some days, our read-alouds take place under a canopy of tall pine trees. I can't do this without getting broken up. <sighs> this year has been the most challenging, but the most rewarding. And I'm so proud of all of us, teachers, administrators, students. We couldn't have done it without each other. America's educators are stronger and braver than you think. If we can make it through this year, we can make it through anything. I really um, like that video for many reasons because it touches on the humanity of of teachers, um, individuals who have chosen to enter a school building every single day and work with our children. Um, they are afraid, but also unafraid. And they show up every single day. Um, and so we have to support our teachers we have to um, support them from a trauma-informed approach and give them the same opportunities that we would give anyone else, even though they are working in a school. And so I love this quote that um, a teacher shared. She said, we are not all in the same boat, but we are all in the same sea. Some by yacht, some by boat, and some by clinging to whatever floats our way and fighting with all of our might. And that's what I've been seeing teachers do um, since the, the pandemic started. And so um, if you are a teacher uh, who's joining us tonight, I take my to you. Um, and I will certainly continue advocating um, for teachers uh, throughout the US and, and working with teachers and training teachers, um, as well as parents, because again, um, teachers deserve the same uh, support that everyone else receives as it pertains to COVID. And so we have to ask ourselves, now what? Again, it's the start of um, a new school year. Uh, kids are returning to school, teachers are returning to school, for some schools, no more virtual. So now what? How do we keep moving forward? Um, we have to mitigate collective trauma. And the way we have to do this has to be creative. And we have to layer, excuse me, mitigation strategies. One strategy alone is not going to work. And so for school, we talked about school definitely being a safe place for students. Um, for many students, they have received mental health services and support uh, in school, even when they could not get those services and supports in the community. Here in Georgia, we have a number of schools who um, have contracts with mental health providers or mental health agencies to actually come into the school and meet with the students um, during school time. And that's really important because for most of those students, uh, providers would not go into their neighborhoods or there was a lack of transportation, a lack of uh, parental buy-in, um, just so many factors that would have otherwise um, caused students to not receive mental health care. And so even as we uh, return to school this year, um, I think it's you know clear that more students are going to be be receiving these services in school. Um, and again, we have to be creative in terms of our approach and what this will um, look like. And this also gives us um, more leverage to advocate for more federal dollars, uh, money from um, to be given to nonprofits or for profits. Um, but there definitely has to continue being an emphasis 
on how do we step outside the box, partner with uh, schools, again, whether it's private school or public school, and how do we meet our uh, families where they are to ensure that they are receiving quality mental health services. So here's a few um, strategies that we can use to supporting students in the classroom. First and foremost, it is very, very important that we listen to our students. Gone are the days where students have to take a back seat or sit in the dark or be in the dark um, and not express themselves. Students are holding on to so much. Here at Embark, um, since we opened our doors at Embark at Atlanta North in Georgia uh, last September, there has not been one student who has walked in our doors and not mentioned the stress that they have um, experienced as a result of being isolated or feeling isolated being out of school and not having daily contact with their peers. And so it has been vital that we listen to students, um, that we listen to the positive things, you know, what, what's been growing great for them, but also listening to their fears. Because we know that when we don't listen to students or when we shut them down, that again, we see that increase in anxiety, depression, as well as self-harm. And so we have to listen to our students. The second thing is increase in access. Many uh, companies or mental health uh, companies closed their doors or was forced to close their doors during the pandemic, when really we should have uh, been opening the doors, such as what we were doing here at Embark and increasing access for all families, both psychologically and uh, physically. And so we also have to carry this into the classroom because as students are entering the classroom, if they do not feel that it is, it is a safe space and they have access to a caring adult, you're gonna see some of those unwanted behaviors um, playing out. Also, ensure that uh, you create space for your students to go see the counselor, go see the school social worker, um, be proactive in telling your, your classroom, um, hey, this person is available for you or um, uh, this service is, is available for you. Uh, because we want students to know that the support is there and they should not have to guess. Uh, we talked about safety, definitely um, creating a safe space for all students. Also, name it. A lot of kids are carrying around anxieties. They are carrying around this feeling internally, these thoughts, these beliefs, and they don't have a name for it. And so as adults, as teachers, as behavioral health providers, we have to help the students to put a name to what they are experiencing. And you can do that, especially when that safe space has been created. Um, you'll find that some students will come to you and say, hey, this is what I'm experiencing. Sometimes you may see it um, played out in their behavior. Um, again, we sometimes see students, they have like superficial um, cuts, maybe on their arms. And so we have to work with them to put a name to what they are experiencing so that they can process it and work through it. Next, um, learn his or her story. Even though we've been talking about collective trauma, we've been talking about pandemic, Guess what? Everybody's story is different. So learn his or her, her story. It's okay as adults for us to say, hey, you know, tell me about um, what happened. Tell me um, how you have experienced, 
you know, this past summer or how you've experienced the past year, particularly being out of school. Tell me what life is like for you. So sit and be a listener as opposed to a talker and learn his or her story. And then we want to be able to model grace and compassion. Um, you know, stress, uh, all types of um, responses or behaviors to present itself. And so getting back to the place where we can model grace and compassion and hope is going to be so vital to so many of our children, as well as teachers. Um, every day is not going to be a good day. We're still going to struggle in some areas. Some days you may have a student who um, doesn't feel like talking. You may have a student who comes into the class and have a temper tantrum. You may have a student who just seems like he or she does not care. And so it's going to take us modeling grace and compassion and hope for our students, along with those other things that I mentioned, in order to help um, shift our students out of a, um, a difficult space. Next, you can create um, culturally and trauma-informed practices. And so this is a big one. This is a big one because many schools put a lot of effort into creating trauma-informed approaches at the school. And so that does not just mean, you know, um, uh, having counselors who are available for children. This means working not only with the children, but also with the caregiver, working with other community members, um, creating trauma-informed learning spaces. Um, so just a number of things um, go into this, but it is vital that we create a culturally and trauma-informed approach for all students. Next, we have understanding gender-specific trauma responses. Trauma impacts everyone differently. We know uh, for certain that trauma impacts females very different than it affects males. It impacts different parts of the brain. Uh, trauma is processed very differently when you look at gender-specific um, responses to it. And so it's gonna be vital that teachers um, understand what that means, even as it pertains to how you are providing instruction. And so uh, for, you know, our girls, they may sit and they may talk about, you know, trauma experiences that have occurred. But for our boys, they're going to want to get up, they're going to want to move around. Um, they're not going to really want to sit and, and just talk with you for 45, 50 minutes and, and process um, what has happened. And so understanding uh, gender specific trauma responses is important. And that's something that not only you as a parent, but also as a teacher can advocate for um, in your schools. And you can also find schools who are already doing this type of work. Uh, we saw a quick um, video on Fusion Academy. And so being able to provide a smaller environment, um, having students to engage in, in music and in arts, um, other core curriculum, but from a different angle as, as compared to, you know, a kid who is attending a public school, um, that's very important. That is out of the box learning. It's effective learning. Um, and it's also, um, I said that it's effective. And so um, if you have a child who, you know, is experiencing significant um, social anxiety, will not go back in a classroom, having difficulty uh, learning in large classrooms, then you can certainly think about um, enrolling your child in a much smaller program or school such as uh, Fusion. Next, you can develop a plan with predictable routines. This is important because as the world was so unpredictable, um, school 
is also now unpredictable to many uh, students. And so the more that we have predictable routines, the better many of our uh, students will perform um, in school as well as home. And so as parents, you don't have to do this alone. You know, one of the best ways that I found that works is to actually sit with my children and say, hey, school is starting back up. What is our routine gonna be? What are those things that are um, important to you? What are those things that you don't wanna do, that you do wanna do? What are those things that are non-negotiable when it comes to learning? Um, so sit down with the child and again, allow them to bring their voice to the conversation um, and to the development of that plan. And then get your students moving, get them moving. Our kids have been um, in the house <laughs> for long enough, whether it is a walk in a park where you're still socially distancing, um, the fusion, you know, again, showed the video where they may have a class under the pine trees. And so get the students moving because when you have a student who is um, really dealing with, you know, PTSD, depression, anxiety, and they are being forced to sit in one spot for hours in a day um, to be hammered, you know, with tons of, of schoolwork and not have that opportunity to get up, to move around, um, it's going to be difficult for them. It's going to be really difficult for them. So think about how um, our students can become more creative um, uh, while in school. Build and support of relationships and co-regulate. This is really important because, um, you know, and we've heard this plenty of times that healing um, from trauma happens within a relationship. And so when you're able to co-regulate with the child and build a supportive relationship, that is when you'll see healing. Um, they are going to trust you. They're going to want to talk to you. Um, they are going to continue building the self and really seeing that they are capable. They are uh, capable of doing schoolwork. They are capable of developing um, uh, supportive relationships. They are capable of being loved. They are capable at regulating how they are feeling. They are capable of doing work that's gonna move them from that tough place emotionally. So co-regulating is gonna be really important. And empowering the student's agency. How are you empowering them? You know, are you listening to their hopes, their desires? Are you uh, taking note of their strengths and helping them to, to build those strengths? Are you providing the opportunity for them to grow into who they desire to be, um, again, while building on their strengths and while also building resilience. And so again, that goes back to those self-regulation skills, that goes back to um, uh, communication, the ability to develop uh, secure relationships, the ability to, um, examine and see themselves and um, understand who they really are and who they want to be. And then you can also engage in, in mindfulness, um, utilizing or tapping into the, the five senses. And so as you see the picture here, um, this is one of our mindfulness corners um, within our clinic. And so kids come here for our IOP or PHP programs and the kids, when they walk through the door, they absolutely love it. They want to be here. We don't have, <laughs> have a problem getting them through the door. Um, but when they get here, they are really uh, delving into some tough work. They're processing trauma. They're talking about scary issues. They are able to sit and speak with their parents about feelings and beliefs and thoughts they've been holding in for a long time. And we have to recognize that even though they are here for three hours out of the day, they still need a place where they feel safe, 
and where they are able um, to uh, be in the moment and engage in some mindfulness. And so as a teacher, this is another way, even as a parent, as a parent, you can um, suggest, you know, your teacher creating a mindfulness corner, just like this one in a classroom. Um, here in Georgia, there's been some federal dollars that were provided to schools to build um, trauma-informed classrooms. And so this is a great idea and falls right under that um, to just provide students some time or a space, a safe space where they can go um, and, and, and ensure regulation. And then the next one is consider an education wellness consortium approach to learning. And so what this can look like is, you know, parents who um, make the decision not to send their children back to uh, large schools, but maybe to a smaller school that has a relationship with a wellness program. So, and I'm just gonna, uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna take advantage to, to utilize uh, or to, to say fusion and, and embark, right? Because um, we as sometimes could see the same student. And so we know that the student is in a small um, environment. They are doing one to one learning, but they also had the support and are in close proximity to their wellness team. Um, and this is working for parents. We are seeing more parents take advantage of this type of approach uh, within the past couple of years, more so now than ever before, because they do recognize specifically what's best for their individual child, instead of just kind of throwing them or allowing them um, to, to, um, to operate in, in a much larger system. Parents are really recognizing that smaller settings are not bad, but could be more beneficial for some children who need both the education support as well as the wellness support. And so I mentioned that I wanted to talk a little bit about the trauma-informed social emotional learning um, and the core competencies there. And so social, emo social emotional learning um, has been around for some time. And it is really, it was really designed to foster youth social emotional development um, that really seeks to create a safe and reliable environment where children who have experienced all types of traumas really feel supported. It welcomes um, their strengths, their identities, exercises their agency, um, and can develop meaningful and positive relationships with adults and peers within a learning community. And so it's not just enough to say, hey, um, I'm going to teach this child how to regulate one's emotions, or um, we're gonna label your feelings or um, base decisions on safety, social and ethical considerations. You're going to learn how to seek help and then develop empathy and perspective taking. Well, you have to also consider the early childhood experiences of the student. You have to um, take into consideration that of their family or their community and how the trauma has impacted them directly. Because if a child can't even name the trauma, if a child does not have support outside of the school, how can schools do this work alone um, and not have it be trauma informed? And so there's just so many layers here um, with social emotional uh, work, again, it needs to be trauma informed. Uh, it needs to include not only the child's voice, but also the family's voice, that of the community, um, other support systems within the school. And so for teachers, if you're not familiar with trauma informed social emotional learning, 
even parents, I would say take advantage and ask questions. Um, speak to your child's um, school social worker or the school counselor and ask them, how are you ensuring that um, you are addressing these core competencies um, with, with the kids in, the, in that particular school? And then for our teachers, as I mentioned, our teachers need, you know, just as much support as our children do. And so there are several ways that we can um, support the teachers. Again, teachers should feel safe um, as they show up for work every day. If they are in environments where most of the teachers are burnt out, where most of the teachers are traumatized, where there's decreased communication and trust, it's gonna be hard for those teachers to feel a sense of safety and show up as their best selves. And so we have to ensure um, from a leadership perspective within the schools that those um, opportunities are being provided to every single teacher as well as support person in the schools. Secondly, name it. The same thing that I mentioned, you know, with the kids, name it. If as a teacher, if you are feeling stressed every day, if you are feeling like you have compassion fatigue, that you are on the cusp of, of burnout, um, if you you know find yourself being snappy at the children or not being able to really listen to the needs of the kids as well as provide instruction, you may need some help in naming what is going on with you. Is it, you know, a, a trauma response? Is it the trauma that you've um, experienced in the last, you know, 18 months to two years? Uh, are there other things that are going on that need to be addressed? And so you definitely want to uh, be able to put a name to it. And then again, with teachers, understand your story understand your story. What has your journey um, been? How is it now? And how is it impacting you? And so um, does this mean that, you know, you uh, get a life coach? Does this mean that you get um, or become connected to a therapist or psychologist or psychiatrist? But don't be afraid to meet with someone to develop that relationship and talk about your story and what has impacted you so that you can have some clarity on what, you know, what's going on with you and what support you need to keep moving effectively. Also, show yourself some grace and compassion. There are many super women there are many supermen, but guess what? The cape has to come off sometimes and you have to show yourself the same grace, the same compassion that you would show someone else who is in need. Um, you know, and most of you I'm sure have heard this, uh, when you board an airplane and you're instructed to put your oxygen mask on self, you have to make your self-care a priority. If you're no good for yourself, you're not gonna be any good for anyone else, especially your students who need you at least five days a week. So you have to make self-care a priority and create community. You don't have to do this alone. Again, uh, for many individuals, um, they have been so frustrated um, so fearful, um, not wanting to um, be perceived as a burden onto other people, but it is okay to create community um, of like people, of individuals who are different, who are not experiencing what you're experiencing, but we, we are a communal person, and so Create community, definitely identify uh, individuals who you can call when you need support, even if it's just someone um, to listen to you. And that also includes uh, you not being afraid to seek professional help. 
there's nothing wrong with it. We had to continue uh, knocking down that um, stigma around mental health. It is okay for anyone to seek professional help, whether it is a teenager or an adult. And then know when to say, Ted, you're it. We all need a break. <laughs> Even if you know, you're know you in school, um, and I'll share with you um, that here in Georgia, again, you know, I mentioned that there were federal dollars that were um, awarded to schools who created uh, trauma-informed classrooms, not only for the students, but also trauma-informed um, centers for the teachers. And so at one particular school, they developed something called the well. And so for the well, it is a safe space only for teachers, no students. Teachers can go in, um, they can sit and they can speak with someone about just how they're feeling. They can debrief, they um, keep healthy snacks and drinks there. Uh, the lights, they have special lighting in the room. So it's just an opportunity for teachers to go in and decompress during the day um, while they are being supportive of, of students because they too realize that um, it's difficult. It's difficult. Some days you may be more of a counselor um, than you are, you know, that person standing up and teaching them new math, uh, math problems. Um, and so you have to be unafraid. You have to be willing. And you also have to advocate uh, for your well-being as a teacher, even inside of the, the school. And know that it's not going to um, get 100% better just overnight, that it's definitely a journey, um, but you deserve it. And um, this is something that um, you can definitely, in terms of the support um, that you could definitely receive and should receive as a teacher. Kathleen, do we have any questions or comments? We do have just one comment if, if they can access the PowerPoint. Um, and then someone did make a comment that they loved your cape analogy. Thank you. And the answer to the PowerPoint is yes. Okay. We have, we can access this PowerPoint, someone said. If you have any other questions, you can put it in the Q&A and I'm happy to ask Sharnell and take a little break if you'd like. Thank you. And so um, remember, this is, gonna, this is gonna take a community. Um, the pandemic was not, did not occur in isolation. And so it's gonna take a community of um, people, of systems of care that really understand trauma, equity, as well as self-determination, really to facilitate or help facilitate the recovery process or the healing process for our students, as well as our teachers. Um, but when we begin to overlook these issues, or overlook what is required. Oftentimes we can re-traumatize individuals or systems and it helps to perpetuate things which have inten intentionally caused harm or the greatest harm to many of our um, communities. And that is something that we do not want to do. So trauma-informed uh, community engagement. These are just a few things that are non-negotiables when it comes to building trauma-informed community and school engagement. And so whatever the approach is, it must be realistic. Whatever um, the goal is, it has to be realistic. We have to be truthful. Our approach has to be truthful. We have to provide education, not only to the students, but the teachers, uh, parents, other community stakeholders, and it has to be consistent. It has to be consistent. It's not gonna work if we start something one month and then the following month, you're changing it up. Um, everything is just gonna fall apart or seem chaotic. And so it does have to be consistent. And we also have to be transparent about new opportunities. You know, I talked about 
um, uh, schools who were provided funds. Um, you know, are we being transparent about that? Are we inviting our parents who are stakeholders, our teachers, are we inviting them to the table to say, hey, this is an opportunity. How can we work together to provide um, um, or, or to receive the best benefit um, of this? How can we um, increase the support to our children? And then also acknowledge the community's trauma. We have to continue doing a better job at this and not um, just putting all of our students into, into just one box or all of our families or teachers into one box. We have to acknowledge the community's trauma because again, even though we all experience the impact of COVID, some communities in, um, um, experience increased community-based trauma, um, hunger, uh, um, decreased financial resources, um, a lot of people lost their homes, um, transportation. So we have to acknowledge the community's traumas. Adopt a two-gen approach. And what I mean by this is that um, you can't just work with the child. If you decide to only work with the child, you may not see the full fruit, fruits of your labor. And so have that uh, parent or that caring or non-offending caregiver at the table, have their support system, whether it's a church, whether it's, you know, Miss Jenkins from the library down the street, whether it's Miss Pearl who sits at her window all day to make sure the kids are getting to school. Um, so have their support, have support systems at the table uh, because oftentimes when we see the kids are impacted, particularly around trauma, it is generational trauma. Um, and we understand the, um, the impact the generational trauma can have on a system. Agencies must also acknowledge your absence and or limitations. It is nothing worse than um, giving a family a false sense of hope. And so, you know, if, if um, your child is not um, uh, fully showing up, you know, at a large school, again, go to a smaller school, ask those questions, ask the tough questions, um, ask them, you know, what support, is someone gonna pick up the phone if, if my child is, is absent and, um, you know, ask me, hey, you know, is your child okay? Is anything going on? If they see that the child is struggling, you know, is someone going to reach out and say, I've noticed that your child is struggling. How can we support you? Because again, for some parents, they are also dealing with their own unresolved trauma and sometimes may not have the emotional um, strength to show up every single day. And so, Agencies um, or even schools um, should should be truthful and forthcoming about uh, their absences or or uh, limitations and how they can best support the family. Or if they can't support the family in some ways, we just have to be honest about that. And now we do have one question that might be a good place to. And I don't know if you're going to answer this. Um, one individual has asked for adults with depression returning to school what resources are avail available to them? Yep, um, and so for adults and I, I can <laughs> answer that question. I was actually, um, actually taught on a collegiate level. And so for some colleges, they, or for most colleges really, they also have um, counseling centers. And so counseling centers can support adult learners the same way we support, um, uh, school-age children. And so does that mean, you know, that they have an identified or suspected diagnosis, they need more time on the test, um, they need therapy, oftentimes you can get it free through the counseling center. So schools or colleges do have um, uh, resources for adult learners, even if it's a night school. Oftentimes night school programs are connected with a local um, uh, behavioral health company, um, or they receive support through um, 
through the state. The other thing is vocational rehab, uh, which is really good for adult learners. And I know here in the state of Georgia, they will actually pay for adult learning, um, learner education or programs, but voc rehab, were you gonna ask a question? Nope. Okay, um, but vocational rehab, they do a full assessment. When adults come in to um, assess their strengths, uh, behavioral health or mental health problems, and they help the adult learners to make connections um, in the community, whether it's with the doctor, therapist, psychiatrist, um, and they make those connections so that they can be um, successful in their learning. So a lot of resources available for adult learners. Let's see. And so I think I stopped at provide space for open communication, a new path forward, and value interpersonal connection. So again, that is that um, attunement that is uh, creating the opportunity for growth, for secure connection, relationship, um, in order to um, really engage both the community as well as um, the school. So this is the last video that I want to show you. Um, and if, if any of you have <laughs> watched the Kid President's videos, um, it will certainly bring joy to your heart. And so this is a message that I want to send or share uh, with any parents, any teachers who have joined us tonight, prior to me kind of uh, jumping into some self-care stuff. But I want you to hear this message because at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, I want you to be encouraged. Um, there's that red cape again, even though he has it on, sometimes you have to take it off. But um, the bigger note here is that I want you to be encouraged as you um, prepare to go back into the classroom. So let's watch this. This one goes out to the heroes. <laughs> Every day, heroes. Yeah, I'm talking to you. You probably are like, I'm not hero, you're talking to the wrong person. And I'm all like, you're talking to your TV. So listen up. I think you're a hero and you don't even know it yet. Maybe you're like me, you look in the mirror and you don't really see a hero. You look and you just see a regular kid. A really good looking regular kid. <laughs> but you, you're a hero. Whether you're a kid or a grown up. You're way more than you might think you are. You're more than your problems and you're more than your mistakes. Somewhere inside, you're a hero. You might not have a cape or wear underwear outside your clothes. That's probably a good thing. <laughs> you have everything right now to change the world. Everything! Heroes are just ordinary people who've done extraordinary things. They inspire other people to be extraordinary. People like Nathaniel. He's 12 years old and he's now okay with the fact that there are people in the world who don't have clean water. He raised enough money to help 30 schools in Central Africa. Madison, when she was 15, she created a beauty pageant for boys and girls that have special needs because she wanted to celebrate real beauty. My friend Bob, he's 55 and he's living out love in so many different ways. Right now he's working on building the school so kids in Uganda know they're loved. Kids can change the world and grown-ups can change the world. It would go a whole lot faster if we work together. Heroes are made when ordinary people like you and me decide to be extraordinary. Or extra, extra, ordinary. Extra, 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 ordinary. Yeah, uh, that's too many extras. Yeah. Here's what I'm trying to say. If you want to be awesome, treat people awesome. It's about strength. Fire power. Not like picking up a car kind of strength. I'll pick it up and just drop it and go like, oh, he's so nerdy, but so strong. I want to go out with him. He can pick up a car. But it's not about that. I'm talking about compassion. Nothing stronger than that. It's what changes things. So who's been the hero to you? Da -da -da. Parents? Teachers? Friends? Let them know. 
Heroes don't always know that you're heroes. We all need reminders. The little things that we do are a big deal. Heroes are people in our lives who see us what we really are. Awesome. Did you hear that? Uh-huh, I said it. You're awesome! You're awesome! You don't need a cape and you don't need money. You don't even need to be bitten by something radioactive. You just need to care. And if you are bitten by something radioactive, you should go to a doctor, sir. It'll make you pee green. It would be cool to fly or be part spider or be part squirrel. I don't think part squirrel is a thing. Is that a thing? Like a man squirrel? But you're already filled with superpowers. So don't wait for a signal in the sky. Look a little closer at the world around you. You're ready right now. It's time to be the hero that you're meant to be, Cake. What are you not okay with? Think about it. Now what do you have? And who can you bring with you? Everybody! 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 You have everything that you need to make someone's day more awesome. Someone may never told you this, but I promise it's true. The world needs heroes, and that hero could be you. That hero could be you. And that hero could be you. Yeah. Let's do this. Any comments? I think everyone agrees that was pretty awesome. And it gave <laughs> all the feels for sure. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, and so as you said, you don't have to wait for a signal in the sky. Um, you don't want to be bit by something radioactive. <laughs> um, but just take a minute for yourself. Um, oftentimes, that, that's all we need. Sometimes we need a little bit more, but take a moment for yourself. Um, I have a, a really good friend and colleague who um, has written a book on self-care. Her name is Anana Harris Paris. And um, she has what's called the Sister Care um, Alliance in multiple states. And they talk about how self-care is revolutionary. And so how you now think about self-care and approach your self-care must be revolutionary. With everything that has gone on in the past, with the collective trauma, with um, just so many changes in how we now have to approach life, we have to take a revolutionary approach to our self-care. And whether it's mindfulness, it's praying, it's team building, it's recognizing your limits, vacationing, we have to be intentional about it. We don't have to take these huge steps. Every little baby step matters. Even if you think about what you want to do, that is a revolutionary baby step that is going to result into, your, um, into you succeeding or meeting your goal. And so this picture at the bottom um, is my team engaging in revolutionary self-care. Um, there was a time where I never thought that I would go white water rafting. <laughs> it's a team building activity um, with my team. And yet we as mental health providers also had to learn again, in order to show up as our best selves, which does not mean perfection, that we had to engage in a level of self-care that when you came into our clinic, when you worked with our team, that you would say, you know what? This is a safe space. It's not perfect. The people here, you know, are enduring some of the same things that everyone else in society are, but you know the self-care is happening here. And so it's the same thing that we teach our parents, we teach our teenagers, anyone coming through this door, is going to experience that. And so as a teacher, as a student, be about your self-care plan. And here's that self-care will that I talked about. And I can send this to you if you want it, but these are the areas in which I want you to think about 
what do I need in this very moment, psychological, emotional, spiritual, personal, professional, physical, what do I need in this moment in order for me to take that self-care baby step? Again, not the real huge step, but a baby step. And so, and this is, um, hopefully you can see the writing. Here's just a few examples of what you can do. So for psychological self-reflection, therapy, writing in a journal, a self-assessment, um, for emotional, you know, put some affirmations up on your, your mirror or in your classroom. Um, for me, even, you know, I affirm my children. And so I write notes and I'll stick it on their lunch or on a book, if I know it's a subject that they're having difficulty in, or just in a social emotional area, then I'm intentional about where I put that affirmation. Even spiritual, how are you engaging in self-reflection? Um, how do you cherish yourself? Are you meditating? Are you singing, dancing? Uh, personal, learn who you are. Don't be afraid to spend time with yourself and learn who you are. And if you need support in order to do that, don't be afraid to ask for support. Even professionally, do you love your job? Do you love going into the classroom every single day? What's the best thing that um, you are giving or you're sharing every single day? How are you showing up? And then physical, you know, are you exercising every day? Are you um, not skipping your medical appointments? Are you eating healthy? Are you asking um, uh, for someone to help to nurture you? What's your level of intimacy just with other people who are safe and who care about you? So take some time and complete your self-care will. It's a live and breathing document. It may change, you know, a month from now, but keep this going, keep it going and be intentional about it. And here are a few questions to ask yourself as you're doing it. What areas do you want to address? What time frame will you have? There's no rush, that's up to you. Who do you need to tell? Do you need a self-care buddy? Who do you need to support you? Outside of your self-care buddy, are you working with the therapist? Are you working with the life coach? Is it your supervisor who's able to support you in some way? What do you have to give up? This is a hard one because sometimes we have to give up things in order to um, move through that healing journey. So if there's something that's not good for you or been holding you back, maybe it's time to give it up. And what do you need to add? Is there anything um, that you need to add in your safe space, in your life, in order for you to really engage in self-care? And what resources do you need? All of these are really important questions. And so here are just a few resources that I wanted to share with you. Um, Again, if there are other resources that you would like, feel free to reach out to me at any time via email, um, Embark Behavioral Health. Our website as well as phone number is there, Fusion Academy. Also, Education Consultants. I've listed a few here. Um, education consultants are extremely, extremely helpful in working with families one-to-one -to, -one to really address the education needs of children who may need alternative um, uh, settings in order to, to complete their educational goals. Um, so certainly consider education consultants. And then for some general information related to the pandemic, uh, CDC, if you're in Georgia, we have a Georgia Department of Health. Every state has one and they typically have a 24 seven line as well as the Department of Education. They do have a list of COVID resources available for not only families, but um, educators, medical providers, et cetera. And then also, if you like, take a look at the Texas Institute for Child and Family Wellbeing or uh, the ACES website to learn more about the ACES um, and what that means for a lot of our children. 
And so if you have any questions, um, definitely please ask your questions. Um, if you want to share your thoughts, um, you can always go, and this is our Google card. And so you can always go to Google. Um, you can um, leave your thoughts about this uh, webinar there um, or anything that you've heard. Um, and so Kathleen, any questions? Uh, not so far. Everyone is really loving the presentation. It's super timely. Would love access to the PowerPoint presentation, the videos, all that good stuff. All right. So if anybody has some questions, feel free to put it in the Q&A section. And also just, uh, I know we have some questions about the CEUs. Um, that will be sent to you for those that were present during the entire presentation. Um, feel free to email me if you have any questions, but I just wanted to add, add that in before uh, Dr. Miles goes into any q and I'm curious to know if more, any schools or teachers out there know if teachers are getting any additional support um, from school districts as they go back to school, if anybody's aware of that. Yeah, and I will, um, I'll tell you that um, some of the teachers here in this region uh, were able to meet as cohorts and just talk about additional support. Um, many of them were provided information, you know, for EAP services or uh, resources outside of the school, uh, but they were definitely um, um, supported in terms of talking about what the beginning of the school year may look like and how to best um, support students. Um, although that anxiety is still there, um, you know, they, they have received some support. Well, I, I will have to say this, you addressed a lot of my personal anxiety. So, so thank you, especially in the beginning part when we're actually talking about, you know, I feel like we've moved through this so much like a train, just next thing, next thing, next thing, um, that this fall, especially we're going to take, hopefully we can take some time to reflect and yeah. address all of this. So, so thank you for, for addressing that. You're absolutely welcome. Um, I saw someone speaking about admin. Um, and so one of the important things to definitely know is even though this presentation really addressed children and teachers, we have to continue addressing this with everyone, whether it's admin, the bus drivers, um, transportation, you know, individuals who work in the cafeteria, the janitor. Um, because we're like like that that uh, quote said, we're all in the same sea right now. So yeah, Tracy was saying our admin would love to support teachers. I think everyone is feeling frazzled. They do offer a sunshine committee um, to everyone, like snacks and pick me up, but it's just not enough. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 to tag along on that, I feel like as administrators, I feel like nothing that we do is enough because we're all in this together. We've all the whole title of this is the collective trauma. We are dealing with it as a traumatic event ourselves while helping others that had had this traumatic event in all various different levels different boats like you said right so i if there's any lasting tips that you'd like to give us um as administrators as well yeah sure i would say consistency right um you you you've identified a need and so um, you know, for some schools, they bring in a consultant to do trainings like this um, every so often. So teachers know, okay, every six weeks, we're going to have a training like this. And we also have an opportunity to debrief, to learn about additional resources. And I always say, throw some fun in there. I mean, we're <laughs> people are stressed enough. So team building. Uh, um, think outside the box. Staff lunches are great, but get outside of the office and do something together while still being safe, social distancing. 
Um, and, and make it exciting, make it exciting because what people want now is just something to hold on to. And when you find that something to hold on to, you're going to continue to see your teachers, um, just thrive. So I agree. Uh, scavenger hunt was actually one of the things I was thinking too <laughs> for our teachers. Fun, right? That we, I feel like a lot of times we're just we're living in a lot of worry, um, yeah. you know, and um, building the strength and the resilience that we have while still acknowledging that we've gone through all of this is really important. Um, and another key thing that you said, right? Six weeks, every, yep. keep it consistent. I think throughout this entire pandemic, we, we sprinkled in, you know, what, what, what professional development can we do right now, right? but we have to keep it consistent yeah. for actual change, um, which is the first thing that you addressed um, in this workshop. So, so thank you for that. Any other questions? Someone did say last year, we did some fun Friday events, canceled classes and brought a bunch of sports equipment and games to um, the field and music. Kids love playing together. And I know we've experienced, Charnel showed some stuff about white water rafting. Our team went to an amusement park. Yeah. Um, Karina and I held a self-care event just to have connection and fun. And it definitely makes a difference yeah. when you can get some people together and put some of you know the difficult things aside and really have some fun. Music, um, just connection, talking. It's really, really worth it. Well, I see that we're at our seven o'clock burger. So um, I just want to thank you, Dr. Miles, um, for your time, um, for that amazing presentation. I was taking notes. So was my daughter. <laughs> so thank you so very much. Thank you, Kathleen, um, for taking this idea and like bringing it forward. I know a lot of us have been yearning for something like this, something that we can speak about something that we can bring back to our teams and something to reflect on. So thank you. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to Kathleen or myself. Um, I will also add information for Dr. Miles as well. Um, we are so grateful. Kathleen, would you like to uh, end off for all of us? Yeah, I appreciate everyone taking the time, certainly Dr. Miles and the collaboration with Karina. It's just such a joy to work with both of you. I know everyone is asking for the uh, information. You did register and we can reach back out to everyone. So feel free, you know, feel secure that we're going to get in touch with you for sure. And this is what it's all about. Even though we have our own separate programs and things that we're working at, it definitely takes a community and everybody on here uh, to make it possible that we all succeed and have resilience. So I am really grateful for the both of you, for everyone on and the community that I'm a part of to really help more teens and families. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, have a good evening, everyone. Thanks. Bye.